next session is staying relevant in a hyper-competitive media landscape. Is the industry doing enough? And our speaker is Norm Johnston. He's the global CEO of FAST, global chief digital officer Mindshare Worldwide. Uh, he has been involved in interactive marketing since graduating from Chicago's Northwestern University in 1988. After completing his MBA from Duke University in 1995, Norm joined the country's first digital agency, Modem Media, which revolutionized the advertising industry by placing the first banner ad on the internet. Uh, he joined Mindshare in 2007 as CEO, and in 2008, he was promoted to a broader global responsibility and currently manages over 2,000 digital staff in 115 cities around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to welcome Norm Johnston on stage, please. They've taken all the chairs away. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, we'll make sure we get them back. Check. All right, Norm. All right. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> uh, this is on behest of Norm that I'm joining over here, if I may. Uh, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. I love coming to India. It's a short trip, but uh, I, love in I live in London. I'm American, but I, we live, I live in London. And uh, I've been there for about 20 years, and we've got a lot of really good Indian food in London, which we eat quite often, but it's not as spicy as the food here. So I had lunch here and I can't feel my tongue. It's been about an hour, my tongue is still numb. But the food was great. Yeah, we have a little spicy food in India. Uh, we like it, so we're not even apologetic about it. Right, Mr. Sodhi, we don't really apologize for Indian food. Uh, but I'm glad you're enjoying your stay here. And is there anything you would like to say to the audience here before we start off with the interrogation that we have? Okay, all right. Sounds good. It's good, so do you have yes. a few words for them? Uh, for, well, about what? What do you want about me to About anything. Because I have well, my questions ready for you, so. Uh, well, I, I, you know, it's funny. It's, it's an, I've been in digital since pretty much day one, and I think it's just an extraordinarily exciting time. Uh, and it's funny because when I go to different markets, they're kind of in different spectrums in the kind of digital revolution. But, you know, I think we're about to go through what I call the third wave of digital disruption. And the first being the desktop, second being mobile, which you guys know about very well. And the third is the Internet of Things, which I think is going to be a massive change uh, to what we can do in the marketing world. Um, and that's scary for a lot of people, but really, really quite exciting for, for me. And, uh, you know, you can see that change in the way that we interact with technology, the intelligence through AI, the immersive nature in, in things like augmented reality. So, I don't know, it's a great time. To, to be in the business. And IoT is something that is being spoken about across all industries actually and uh, well I would love to know how it affects uh, the digital marketing scene as well. Uh, but I'm sure a lot of people have questions here but we've handpicked a few uh, from really prominent marketers. We're going to have the questions uh, on screen for your benefit as well uh, with the names of the people who have asked them. Uh, so I'm going to dive right into it now. Uh, our first question is how does a brand ensure that the user experience is consistent and positive throughout the digital transformation journey of the brand. And uh, yeah, as you can see, we have the question by Shruti Salvi, Assistant General Manager Marketing, uh, Merck Electronics Limited. So, well, it's, uh, I think, you know, the, the, as I mentioned, the, the second wave of digital disruption around mobile has been, it's been a really interesting thing to see that unfold over the last couple of years. And I think the challenge that, that we have with a lot of companies is that they often still think TV first, particularly the creative agencies. And uh, it's interesting that a lot of clients now bring media agencies at the very beginning of the process versus bringing us in a little bit later because we beat up the creative agencies <laughs> quite a bit. And you know, simple things such as if you are creating a quote unquote TV spot, you know, make sure it's, it's built for mobile, think about vertical formats, think about sound that's off. Uh, think about the broader experience and ensure you connect it all together. 
And as we go through this third wave of digital disruption, you know, that, that challenge becomes even greater as we see brands begin to, to develop utilities and experiences uh, using things like the inter Internet of Things uh, technology. And I think a lot of the creative agencies really struggle with that. They not only struggle with mobile, they're now really struggling with this notion of having to develop much deeper embedded experiences. And hence you see the, you know, the emergence of the Accentures of the world and these companies that have really deep technical experience that can build those sorts of ecosystems. But of course what they lack is the, the creative. They can bring the functional element but not the emotive element. And uh, so it's got to be complicated if you're a client sitting there thinking, okay, I need something that's emotive, it's, it's creative, it changes opinions and shifts perceptions of the brand, but at the same time I need technical chops as well. Uh, you know, the, the, the one advantage of the Internet of Things uh, is that it brings a lot of data, and I do think the companies that, that do very well with this, you know, and this is, I think, another uh, shifted mindset, because when your consumers look at you, they're thinking about Uber and Amazon and Tesla and Apple, and they're not, so their benchmark is much higher in terms of the overall experience that they're going to have, and those companies are extraordinarily good at taking data and using data to inform what they do, whether that's content, uh, whether that's um, using it for media purposes or to refine or iterate on top of uh, the existing assets that they've got. And so I think clients also have to get much better at data and using that data to really try to find insight and then adapt very quickly. Uh, you mentioned the big names over there and we all know how, uh, I mean, they use their data for influencing the choices you make online. But uh, are you saying that these uh, processes can only be implemented by the big guys or even small businesses that think of doing it can in some way manage that data? No, I, you know, the, 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 it's, the notion of big data to me is a bit of a fallacy. I mean, you could, of course, having lots of data that you can use because it's statistically significant is a benefit. But sometimes you're taking little singular pieces of data and using that to, to, you know, to create better experiences. Uh, one example is Orbitz which is a Swedish travel company. They have an app. So if you fly to Mumbai and you're looking for a hotel, they'll use one singular piece of data to refine the experience that they're going to give you. So how many, how many people in the room are Android users? A few of you. How many are Apple OS users? How many BlackBerry users? There's always one. There's got to be one BlackBerry user out there. There always is one. You can type fast. There's nothing wrong with it. Well, what Orbitz does is they'll take a look at your operating system. So if, if you're an Android user, they'll suggest a Holiday Inn. And if you're an Apple OS user, they'll suggest the Four Seasons. Because they know that Apple users tend to spend $40, $50 more on a hotel booking uh, than, than a non-Apple user. So sometimes singular pieces of data, it could be weather data, has a huge impact. We know that, uh, for example, when it rains, you're likely to pay 56% 50 more on a gym membership than not. So we have all these little statistical pieces of data that we can use to refine experiences, um, including media. All right. Uh, a second question is, what can publishers and agencies do to battle the emerging trust issues in view of bots driving up impressions and Russia interfering in US elections. And this question comes to us from Apurva Chamaria, Vice President and Head Corporate Marketing at CL. That's a, it's a political one, isn't it? It's I, I, I suspect the US probably does similar sorts of things, so I don't want to judge Russia on that. But the, uh, it's been a difficult year. It, you know, and I've been in digital, as I said, since day one, so a lot of these issues have been around for a long time. You know, we've always had brand safety issues. We've always had issues with, with ad fraud. I think the big difference this year is that, you know, the digital budgets are now huge. So you go to the UK, over 50% of spend is now on digital. Uh, the number's about 35% globally. That'll go to nearly 50% by 2020. So it's big enough now that when these things happen and when you have on the front page of a newspaper an example of, of a big brand next to some ISIS content, on YouTube, the CEO of the company sees it, and the CMO sees it. So it's become a board level issue. And, you know, brand safety, for, for example, you know, the, the analogy that I use with that, it's like doping at the Olympics. You're never going to get rid of it. Someone's always going to come up with another way to dope. The question is, how do you mitigate it and try to reduce it to the point where it's nearly non-existent? 
And you know, my sense is that uh, Google and others took their eye off the ball. You know, I, you know, if you're Google, you can imagine you're sitting there as a brilliant engineer and you're given the choice of developing autonomous cars and life in perpetuity or trying to prevent brand issues on YouTube. You probably want to go do the autonomous cars. So I think they took their eye off the ball. We've had to work really hard this year to make sure that they put some more rigor and discipline and that br all those brilliant algorithms into ensuring that these things are minimized. They'll never be completely gone. And I th think the same thing with, uh, with, with transparency and verification. You know, we, particularly as Group M, have been relentless with them that they can't grade their own homework. It's just silly for them to think that they can generate a report and give it to a client and clients should just roll over and say, okay, great. And I can tell you with every analysis I've ever seen with Google that goes to a client, the answer is always spend more money on search, spend more money on YouTube, spend more money on DBM. And of course, people don't live that way. They read newspapers and they go to other websites and apps and so on and so forth. So we've worked very hard this year to pressure them into third-party verification so we can get some objective data and what's happening, and surprise, when you get that information, it tells you different things. It leads you to different decisions, either on media investment or when it comes to video, for example. We know that the average video duration time on Facebook is a lot less than we thought it was. Well, that could simply change the way that you create video assets for Facebook. You know that you only have about two seconds, three seconds to make an impact on somebody. So we're not touching on the political bit at all about how nervous... I'm not going there, no. Oh, fair enough. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's not my question, so I'm kind of okay with that. I'm sure I've got some clients that are Trump fans. Oh, you can, so I'm not going to go there. We can take it offline and maybe... We'll uh, take it offline. Yeah. I'll have a drink with any of you to talk about it yeah, later. Then we can have that conversation. Yeah. Uh, our next question is from Shantanu Gangane, Head Marketing View India. It says, uh, it asks rather, digital marketing is the new buzzword. You see young talent enhancing their skill set in digital marketing. Spend on digital marketing are increasing, but as we move ahead, do you see digital marketing getting automated? Uh, are AI and automation going to replace the role of a digital marketer? Well, I, I, you can't avoid it. I mean, the reality is it's, uh, and you're, you're foolish to think you can disregard it because if you do, your, your competition will, will leverage AI technology. And you know, the, the reality is there are parts of our business that are very mundane and that should be done, that either should be automated or we should apply artificial intelligence. So when you look at programmatic media, for, for example, and we're doing quite a bit of that, you know, there are elements of that where we're now actively using things like IBM's Watson technology to identify patterns, which it does very well. Uh, but it's not binary. I, I, you know, I think you know, there, there, there's still... You, in, effectively, when you're going to programmatic, you're kind of going from like a Fiat to a Ferrari. It's a much more sophisticated engine to drive. And while AI is incredibly important for that, you also need people that, you know, the, the people that can drive a Fiat are very different than the people that are Formula One drivers. You need more advanced people to, that understand uh, the data and can make sense of that and look at it and, dri and drive the vehicle, if you will. And I also think that uh, it's not binary in the sense that, you know, the, as good as AI is, and it can do a lot of things, particularly with machine learning, looking for patterns, it doesn't come up with brilliant ideas. And it's not creative, and I, there's still a large amount of room in our industry, as our team here does in India, you know, they just won a, a, a Grand Prix at Cannes last year, for, and AI doesn't come up with that. That's a brilliant idea. So you still need that. I think where the impact is, is, will be felt more is that our job from a media perspective, which has historically been trying to convince you to do something, we're sending you some sort of message to try to convince you, it's, it's uh, very explicit. Our job will increasingly be implicit communication to AI, to try to convince AI. So once you've got Siri, Cortana, Alexa in your house or in your car, and you're asking those, those artificial intelligence, those bots, if you will, for the best recipe, for the best product, or for the best hotel in Mumbai, or the best car, or whatever, we've got to figure out a way of convincing those AIs to, to recommend our clients to you. So in a way, our job is increasingly around implicit communication to AI, to get into that algorithm, uh, whether through paid means or through organic means, to convince them to, to make those sorts of recommendations. And that's incredibly complicated. If you talk to Amazon around how Alexa makes decisions, it's not a simple answer. I mean, it's based on product reviews, historical purchase, 
Bing search results. So there's a whole host of things in there that, that we need to kind of crack the code on that because increasingly that's where you will look to to buy things and get, get answers to certain things. All right. Uh, it's interesting you mention Amazon and Alexa because uh, I'm part of their marketing campaign. So oh, are you? That's something I oh, do. Oh, I didn't understand. realize that. Do you like Alexa? Oh, well, they let me use You kind of have to say you do, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. It's kind of cool. <laughs> She's great. Well, let me just go because yeah, that, that's a, it, it is amazing what they have done. I was talking about, the, the, I heard the innovation panel a little bit. Or This is a company that, did anybody buy the Fire Phone here? Exactly. I mean, it, you, they, you couldn't give those things away. I think they're selling them for like a dollar on eBay at the moment. And they have just relentlessly innovated, and they have just, I think, knocked it out of the park over the last year with, uh, who has an Echo here? Does anybody have an Echo? I mean, it's a real game changer when you get it. It completely fundamentally changes the way that you interact with technology. And uh, if you're Google, you have to be a little bit frightened by it, because it totally disrupts the search model. With voice search, there's one answer that comes along, versus with Google, obviously what they want is a bunch of paid advertising. And I, so I think I've, I've, they, they've done a phenomenal job, I think. Yeah, well, I did, you, no one's paying me to say that. I really mean that. I think it's cool. I just tried it once. I think it's cool. That's all I'll say. I won't do any more marketing for that. Right. Uh, our next question is from Manish Adwani, Head Marketing and Public Relations, Mahindra Special Services Group. And his question is, how can brands humanize digital engagements? Well, kind of rubs up from where we left. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's a, I, I, this is kind of a strange question because I think, you know, on one hand, uh, you know, digital can be, can be used to tell stories. I mean, you saw some examples from FCV a little bit earlier. I mean, it's not as if it's, it, if it's uh, all functional and just buying stuff and utilities. I mean, it's, there's some fantastic examples in the industry of, of uh, using it to tell genuine stories. And, and obviously, with, with Twitter and YouTube of, of changing governments and doing things that are quite critical. So to me, I, I think there's a human element that's in, embedded into it. Um, yeah, the interesting bit will be how the internet changes over the next few years as it becomes much more immersive, uh, particularly things with augmented reality. And you know, my, my sense is that increasingly the internet will come out of your mobile phone and come into the real world. So I don't know who's experienced augmented reality, but if you look at any of the projections over the next five years, it, you know, the debate is between AR and VR, and the VR people hate the AR people and the AR people. I mean, literally they get in fist fights, I think, at, at conferences, they, they hate each other so much. But it looks like AR will be the dominant format. Um, and if you look, listen to Facebook or Apple, who we know, by the way, who are developing Apple Glasses with augmented reality in it, we only know that uh, because they had to file an employee accident report into the federal government, the U.S., and in that report there was a woman that had an accident with the Apple glasses, so we know that's the only reason we know it. So I think you know, you'll find an element of the Internet experience changing quite significantly over the next few years into AR, uh, either through the phone or through things like uh, glasses, maybe Google Glass 2, uh, or Google Goggles 2 will come out. Um, and that will be an interesting, when you, when you have augmented reality and you're looking to buy a house and you can have an augmented uh, person from the bank helping you look at different houses and real estate, I think there'll be an opportunity to humanize the internet even more, but in a slightly different way than we've thought of in the past. Uh, if I could maybe move a little backwards with that, with uh, Google Glass One. Yeah. Uh, I mean, has there been that kind of impact with the Google Glass that you're talking about that maybe... Um, no, because it sucked. Did anybody <laughs> try it? I mean, it was really bad. Yeah, I was just wondering was the same really thing. Bad. Did anyone try the Google Glass? I only saw it on YouTube. Well, no, you, didn't, you didn't miss anything. It really sucked. Uh, you know, they've invested about $500 million into a company called Magic Leap. Has anybody heard of Magic Leap? So if you, if you haven't heard of it, go check it online on YouTube, which it hasn't come out yet. It's a company down in Florida, and they have what they call mixed reality. So it's kind of augmented reality, but even better. And my suspicion would be that if they come out with another iteration, what you see with Magic Leap will be what you see through, through the glasses. But uh, I, you know, I think my sense is augmented will be, the, will be the next big thing. And you look at the combined AR, VR market, it's, it's 
it's uh, supposed to be bigger than television by the year 2020 in terms of the, the different devices that will be sold related to AR, VR technology. So it's something to keep an eye on. I was just going to ask you that. That was going to be my next follow-up yeah. question of when do you see this happening? Till, But if you're saying 2020... Well, I say these things and then I have to remember that, you know, <laughs> when you're in Silicon Valley, there's yeah. one thing going on and then when you go to Ohio, there's another thing altogether. So. These things happen at different stages around the world. It depends on the infrastructure that's out there. But yeah, the one area to look at is China as well. China is phenomenal with innovation. And Singles Day, uh, which happens November 11th, 1111, if you want to check out one day where you're going to see some really superb innovation, I would look at that day. And last year, they did, Alibaba did a whole virtual reality shopping experience. Chinese love to go shop abroad. They love to come to London. New York, and they did a complete VR shopping experience with Macy's in New York, and it's unbelievable. So you could literally, from your house in China, go shopping in different countries. So I would, I would look at that day as, if you want to pick one day in the calendar to look at innovation, pick that day. All right, we look forward to that. Uh, we'll move on to our next question, which is from Karan Kumar, Head Brand and Marketing, Fab India. And his question is, can there ever be one true measure to appraise the digital and social media platform performance, or is that a wild goose chase that marketers have committed themselves to? Wow, that's an interesting it's a, it's question. That's a good question. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, funny because I do remember the days of, uh, you may still get this, I still see it around the world of, you know, we've got to get this many likes and this many shares, and, and you would end up, you know, would sit in these media juries and you would see case study after case study of we got this many likes and that many likes. And I'm like, I have no idea what, what that actually means anymore. It becomes meaningless. And I think we've got, a, at least when it comes to social now, a much better sense as to what the actual impact of a like is. And the reality is it, it's not that impactful. Uh, most people that like, uh, like a brand, for example, are, are probably people that are going to buy that brand anyway. Uh, where the impact comes from is a friend sharing something to you. That is, we know that has an influence on, on your perception of the brand and, and uh, propensity to buy something. But yeah, the metric thing has been uh, been around forever, uh, and you know, it's it, part of the challenge of being in digital is we can measure so much. You know, it's and, and people think, oh, well, TV it's so easy to measure, and you could look at Barb in the UK, the other. Uh, the other television related metric systems and they're really basic and they're full of flaws and you know you don't know if someone's gone off to the refrigerator to get a beer or... but yet in digital because we have so much data the more data you get the more you try to dig into it I, I will say I think we're getting much better at two things one is linking digital exposure into actual sales so what, whether that's the Kantar panel in, in the US or a different panel We've got a much better ability now to track whether it's actually shifted product off of a shelf or through de dealership. Uh, Amazon in particular, and this is why you saw the results today, I mean, they're now, you know, it's possibly a triopoly. We've got Google, Facebook, and now Amazon coming up uh, as, as one of the third, key third players in, in the digital advertising space. And the reason they're doing so well is just because of the proximity to, to buy, that, that collapse between brand and demand and the ability to see something and then very rapidly go by. And of course, they're uniquely positioned to go ahead and do that. And I also think we're getting much better at, at attribution overall. So an understanding of, you know, a couple years ago, Google would take all the credit for everything that was ever done online. And now we know actually no exposure uh, of, a, of an ad, a video ad, or display ad elsewhere does count to, the, to that overall purchase or the fact that there's more than di digital, that we know that, that, that television has an impact or print has an impact. We can see the correlation between running ads in a newspaper or television with some increase in activity online. So you can use that as a proxy metric to, to assess the performance of how you're doing in, in your overall media. We have an example in the UK, uh, Kimberly Clark, one of our big clients, where they actually adapt the television campaigns based on the digital data. Uh, they'll look at flu-related searches on Google and identify, ge geolocate areas in the UK where there's about to be an outbreak of flu and adapt the Kleenex ads. They will run up, increase the, ad, the, the Kleenex ads in Wolverhampton and decrease them in, in uh, Liverpool. Uh, so, so I think it's not only just getting better within the metrics in digital and more sophistication around things like social, but also an understanding of how we can use some of those proxy metrics to, to improve your overall 
performance. Having said that, I guarantee you there will be another like next year, there will be another thing that will come up, and everybody will chase the new shiny object and clamber all of it. So you can't really stop it. So I think we can sum that up as saying that there is no one specific measure, but you can see a relatability between uh, the digital exposure you have and the sales that are, you're eventually getting made now? Well, the, the, the ultimate metric for us will vary. It's the outcome that you want. Uh, what I will say is that even for those clients that have been traditionally very brand focused around shifting your perception of the brand or whatever the, the metric may be, they're now much more focused on the ultimate outcome on purchase and they have the ability now to, to do that through better attribution. So there's no hiding anymore. You, you really have to, the data is there to scrutinize what's working and what's not really working. All right, so you know what's working with the amount of purchases being made. That is the final say. Well, I think for anybody, yeah, if it's not moving <laughs> the business, then you got a problem. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, the sixth question that we have here is from Amit Tiwari, VP Marketing at Havels. Uh, how will AI and chatbots change the landscape of media agencies, and how prepared are we for that? Well, yeah, we kind of covered that one a little bit earlier. I mean, I will say the, uh, the one thing that we're seeing right now is, the, is, it's kind of related to AI's voice, back to Alexa again. I won't hammer on about Alexa too much, but uh, the, the shift in the number of people, particularly millennials, that are comfortable talking to Alexa and to a device, I don't know about you, but I don't do a lot of voice searches. I feel like a bit of an idiot oh, no. when I put my phone out. No, talk neither to do I. <laughs> Who's done a voice search here? Anybody? Right, a few of you. Okay, well, that's good because I feel like an idiot when I do it. But when you look in the US, 40% uh, of uh, uh, smartphone searches are done by voice. That num number goes up to about 56% 50 with millennials. Two thirds of all search will be done by voice by, by 2020. So there's a huge shift in the way that, that people are interacting with the technology. When you look at the 52 billion objects that will be connected to the internet by 2020, cars and fridges and all that, only 5% of them will have a keyboard. So in most cases, you're, you're gonna talk to, to Alexa or, or Cortana or Google to get something done. And that has a huge change on a lot of things. One is the creative experiences. You know, when, when people are not swiping and typing, how do you create a, you know, we did an uh, a, uh, Amazon Echo skill for Hellman's in the U.S., which is a mayonnaise for recipes. So it's a completely different way of thinking about the experience because it's all voice interaction. Uh, it changes the way you optimize for search, and not many people do this right now. They still think of search keywords as text keywords. Natural language queries are, are much longer. You need to think about your own voice. And I always laugh because, honest to God, in this industry, there, there are always three categories, verticals, that lead every innovation when it comes to digital. It's usually gaming, poker, it's usually pornography, and the third one's pizza. And I'm only going to talk about one of them today, but everything that's happened is, you know, a video streaming, click to call, you name it, happens there. And when you look at uh, Domino's Pizza, for example, in the U.S., uh, their app that's on the phone is all voice interaction. It's called Dom. When you open up the app, you can talk to Dom, you can order pizza through, through Dom. And what they've done, getting back to the first point, is they've done a phenomenal job of integrating themselves into this holistic experience. When you order a Domino's pizza and you connect it into your Nest system, it automatically turns off the sprinkler when the, when the delivery man arrives. It automatically rings the doorbell to alert you that the, the, the pizza's there. And I think you're going to see a lot more of that. And it's kind of turning the whole model upside down because in a world where we're so busy, we have so many things going on. Yeah, I don't know about you, but like every time somebody says, oh, you have to watch a program on Netflix, I kind of groan because I think, oh my God, I've got to add that to the list of 70 other programs that people tell me to watch. And then it's great when you, don't, when you watch the first episode and you don't like it. It's, it's almost a relief, like, oh my God, I don't have to worry about the other 20 episodes. So in a world where we have less attention span and more things going on, companies like Domino's who just do things for you, they make it easier. So whether that's your coffee machine automatically reordering capsules for you, or your washing machine automatically reordering personal, or whatever the case may be, I think those are the companies that will be most valuable. That will be the ultimate advertising in, in the sense of uh, the, the brands that you talk about will be the ones that just less clutter and more helpful things uh, to let you get on with your life. Understood. Uh, I will throw this discussion open to the audience if they have a question for Norm here. 
I'm um, making, oh, sure. Um, you um, sit at a table where you see what clients and especially global clients are doing in the US, UK, Europe. When you look at India, what is your forecast for the next three, five years, purely in terms of digital spends as a percentage, where it will be? It's at eight, 10 percent now. Will it be 20, will it be like US, 20 odd percent, or will it be like UK, 45 percent? I, you know, I don't, I don't, I should know the answer to that. I don't know. Um, I'm sure it's going up. And, you know, the, the question that I got uh, a little bit earlier, I was, I was doing an interview, was, has digital dropped because of all the issues around brand safety? And it has not dropped. I mean, I think that there's been a period of pause and reflection and cleaning it all up. But it's irreversible in the sense of uh, everything's simply becoming more digital and people are spending more time with digital. If you look at, I don't know about India, but if you look at linear TV viewing in the U.S. has gone down by 10 hours over, over on a weekly basis, with, particularly with millennials. It's not to say that people are not reading quote unquote newspapers or watching more TV, they are. They're just not necessarily doing it the ways that we did growing up. Uh, so there's a migration and I, I think for, for publishers, you know, it's funny because when I do these media uh, juries, we'll have the best newspaper of the year. And I look at that category and it's funny because everybody does a three minute video for what, you know, their little pitch for why they're the best newspaper of the year. And typically about 30 seconds of the video is about the actual newspaper and the other two and a half minutes are about what they're doing in mobile and what they're doing in an iPad and what they're doing. So you've got the shift from companies that are known for a device or a format into actually companies that are just creating really good content, really compelling content. And the consumption of that content can happen in many different ways, but increasingly I think it is happening in digital. So I don't know the numbers specifically in India. I just got in last night. I should have looked it up. But I do know, as I said, it's about 35% globally right now. It'll be 46% by, by 2020. And you may think it's not going to happen. I've been doing, I, I remember when, when I started in 1995, digital was 0.005%. It's irreversible. It will keep growing. And, you know, we've got 40% of TVs in the U.S. are now connected to digital. Uh, you look at the over-the-top services with Netflix and Amazon, which are increasing. Bizarrely, in the U.S. right now, this is people are, are cutting the cords on the cable. They're get, getting rid of the cable, and there's this new trend with Gen Z who get their TV sets. Um, they basically use Netflix, or they'll get at the uh, Amazon Prime, or they'll get uh, Apple TV uh, to watch all their content. But every once in a while, there's a sporting event that comes along that they can only get through linear TV. So they're buying antennas, old-fashioned rabbit ears, and putting it on their TV. Antenna sales in the U.S. have gone up dramatically. Now, the question is, the moment the cricket and the moment the World Cup and the moment the Olympics get bought by Amazon, game over. I mean, linear TV will, will, will subside, at least in the U.S. I don't know about here. And... Amazon will pay a lot of money for that because the only thing they care about is you subscribing to Amazon Prime because once you subscribe to Amazon Prime, you'll buy twice as much on Amazon, if not three times as much, according to McKinsey. That's the only thing they care. They don't care about the advertising. They don't care about anything else. Uh, so once those rights come up, which they will happen over the next 10 years, look for Apple to buy them, Google to buy them, Amazon to buy them. They can buy them globally if they want to, and they've got the pockets to do it. And that will be the moment when linear TV which frankly most countries right now is only there for live event, live events. That will be the moment when there'll be issues. All right. Um, yeah, we... Yeah. Would you be able to sort of throw some light on that? It, is it... Is it yeah. It goes back to the... And probably the, because of safety issues. Yeah, but if you listen to what Mark Pritchard says very carefully, he, he's not abandoning digital. No, he is not. I think, and you know, I, I can tell you that you can spend a lot of money, money on digital and you can waste a lot of money if you want. And that, that does happen. You know, from our perspective, whatever we invest, we hammer home third-party verification. We will not pay for the impressions unless they're fully viewable and our standard is 100% versus IAB, which is 50. Uh, we beat, beat them up on brand safety. So we're fairly certain that the money that we invest in digital is, is wisely applied and is being seen. 
But not every company does that. And I think probably what happened with P&G, I don't know who does their media, but somebody took a step back and said, what in the world is going on here? And they were probably wasting a lot of mo money on, on digital. But if you listen to Mark Pritchard, he, that, it doesn't mean they're going to kill it or, or it, eventually it will be brought back. It'll just be brought back in a highly disciplined way. Yeah, I had a question. Yep. One of the tensions I see is between uh, agencies and marketers is this discussion about scale. So typically, um, some of the hardcore digital concepts like content marketing or uh, influencer marketing, especially influencers because nowadays we th see things like micro-influencers. Um, when these ideas get presented to the clients, uh, clients often the common question is, can we scale this? Yeah. And um, often initially in the digital programs, it becomes a problem because you need to seed the idea, grow the idea before it can be scaled. So do you see this kind of tension uh, reducing? I mean, will, will the clients move towards appreciating micro experiences? Or do you feel agencies will have to keep looking for scaling options before they get the adoption of the idea? Well, I think it depends on the way that you look at it because uh, the, the, that, that is one of the, when we look at innovation opportunities, that is one of the, the, the criteria that we will look at. You know, can, is this something that's scalable? Now the question is, what do you mean by scalable? Uh, so when I, I won't name clients, but one of the clients that we have is interested in the learning. So not specifically whether or not that influencer needs to be scaled to, for 100 million people or whatever. It, his main interest is, does it work? And can we apply that logic and that model to other parts of our business? Whereas there will be other things, particularly I think with uh, media investments in areas like Snapchat, where the creative formats are very different, so it's much more labor intensive. You know, do they really want to put investment in that area? Is that something that they feel that has legs and longevity? So I think it's a really good question and there's, there's different ways of, of, of looking at it. I think there remains, even with zero budget, uh, zero, well, zero sum budgeting and all these, the scrutiny that there, a lot of these companies, that there still remains a desire and a recognition that unless they keep testing things, they will fall behind. So I cannot think of a client of mine that isn't, it, it doesn't want to know about voice, doesn't want to know about AR, VR. Now they may not spend a lot of money on it, but they want to keep a toe in there to figure out what's happening. Uh, because they recognize through that second wave of disruption, mobile, that first wave of disruption, desktop, a lot of them were laggards. And you know, when you look at the S&P 500 in the US right now, the average lifespan of an S&P 500 company has gone down 50 years. It's only 15 year average now. So it doesn't matter what size you are. There's two guys or gals in Bangalore that are ready to disrupt your business tomorrow and they don't need a lot of assets. What they need is just agility, speed, some venture capital funding, of course, um, and a lot of data and they can, they can do a lot with that. So I think, you know, when you look at um, some of the acquisitions made recently, Million Dollar Shave Club, some of the others, I think there's a recognition that they don't want to get caught in that position again. They're going to have to be a lot more agile. Good question. Uh, I will unfortunately have to stop taking questions from the audience. We I think it's fortunate for them. I think they're ready to move <laughs> on. <laughs> no, they all. Uh, I think it's rapt attention that they're looking well, here th with. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you so Thanks, much, guys. Norm. Yes, let's hear it for Norm, please. And I hope this is working. Uh, if I may invite on stage, Mr. Vinod Srivastav, uh, Senior General Manager, Jagran Prakashan, to, uh, to please come up on stage and felicitate Norm for this brilliant session and being kind with me also. Thank you so much, Norm. I had a great session with you. <laughs> thank you so much, Mr. Srivastava, and thank you so much, Norm.